This morning we're in the third of uh, the series of, uh, of uh, Sabbath School Lessons on Origins. This one is entitled The Creation Completed. Um, it's a Sabbath School for the lesson for the first quarter of 2013, the principal contributor being James Gibson from uh, uh, the Geoscience Research Institute here in Loma Linda. He actually heads the institute right now. Uh, the major editor for the uh, quarterly itself is, the, is Clifford Goldstein. And uh, there are a bunch of other people that uh, contributed that uh, we should at least uh, allow you to see. We've already done Jesus, creator of heaven and earth and creation forming the world. This time we're going to be doing the creation completed and then there's a whole list of things that we'll be going through later on. Um, the memory text for today is Genesis 2-2 NIV. And uh, I have, uh, I don't know, I almost feel like it's easier to pick a, a version and then stick with it. And that's why I kind of if I'm going to memorize anything, I'll do it in Old King, because that's what I started with. But by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And we'll be seeing the King James of that a little later. This week's lesson reviews the Bible's brief description of the last three creation days and the Sabbath rest. This description is found in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, but numerous references to it exist in other parts of scripture. One of the striking aspects, most striking aspects of creation account is its division into days of creation. Why did he choose to make the seven day time cycle that we call a week? It was obviously deliberate. Scripture does not tell us directly, but we can look for clues. Perhaps the most important clue is the Sabbath itself, which reserves a special time for communion between God and humanity. It may be that God established the week to provide for a period of time suitable for ordinary work, yet with a regular time, period of time set aside as a reminder of our relationship to God. This would help humans to remember that God is the true provider and that we are totally dependent on him. Whatever the reason, it is apparent that the Genesis creation account reveals a creation done with exceeding care and purpose. Nothing is left to chance. Uh, Sunday's lesson is the sun, moon, and stars, and it says read Genesis 1, 14 through 19. What actions are mentioned on the fourth day of creation? How are we to make sense of this, especially given our un present understanding of the physical world? And uh, the relevant text is, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And the fourth day has probably been discussed more than any of the other six creation days. That's because people like to quibble, frankly. If the sun was created on the fourth day, what caused the daily cycles for the first three creation days? On the other hand, if the sun already existed, what happened on the fourth day? Uncertainty over the events of the fourth day of creation does not arise from a logical contradiction but from a plurality of possibilities. One possibility is that the sun was created on the fourth day and the light for the first three days came from God's presence or another source such as a supernova. Revelation 21:23 is consistent with this idea as the sun is not needed in the heavenly city because God is there. A second possibility is that the sun, moon, and stars were appointed their functions at that time. Psalm 8:3 seems consistent with this view. 
Hebrew scholar C. John Collins writes that the Hebrew wording of Genesis 1.14 may allow for either of these two possibilities. And there's the reference. A third possibility is that the sun was already in existence but was obscured by clouds or volcanic dust and was not visible or fully functional until the fourth day. One can compare this possibility with the planet Venus, where a similar situation occurs today. The text does not seem clearly to endorse or rule out any of these interpretations, although this does not deter strong opinions on the topic. The strongest one being that there must be a contradiction and therefore we should throw the whole text out. It is probably a good rule not to give questions more significance than the Bible gives it. And we ought to acknowledge that our understanding is limited. This acknowledgement, especially in the area of creation, shouldn't be that hard to accept. After all, think about how many scientific mysteries exist at present. That is, they are right here for experimental science to investigate and yet still remain mysteries. How much more mysterious is something hidden so far in the past? Creation of air and water animals. Read Genesis 1:20 20 to 23, and what evidence, if any, exists in the text that would imply randomness? And the text says, "And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven." And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every wing fell after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. The waters and atmosphere were populated on the fifth day of creation. Many have seen a relationship between the second and fifth creation days. The waters were separated by the atmosphere on the second day, and both were filled with living creatures on the fifth day. The creation events seem to have occurred in a sequence that reflects an intentional pattern, showing the care and orderliness of God's activity. In other words, nothing in the creation account provides any room for randomness. Notice that both water creatures and air creatures are mentioned in the plural, indicating that a diversity of organisms was created on the fifth day. Each creature was blessed with the capacity to be fruitful and multiply. Diversity was present from the beginning. There was no single ancestor from which all other species descended, but each species seems to have been endowed with the possibility of producing various varieties of individuals. For example, more than 400 named breeds have been developed from the common pigeon, and at least 27 breeds of goldfish are known. God apparently gave each of his creatures the potential to produce a great variety of various offspring, further adding to the diversity of the creation. In verse 21, God, said that the, God saw that the creatures he had made were good. This implies that they were well-designed, attractive to the eye, free from defects, and harmoniously participating in the purpose of the creation. Few living creatures excite our imagination and admiration more than birds do. Birds are truly amazing creatures and are wonderfully designed. Their feathers are lightweight but strong, stiff yet flexible. The parts of a flight feather are held together by complex sets of tiny barbs that, produce, that provide strong but lightweight bracing. A bird's lung is so designed that it can obtain oxygen as it inhales and also as it exhales. This provides the high level of oxygen required for powered flight. This result is accomplished by the presence of air sacs in some of the bones. These sacs function to sustain the flow of oxygen and, at the same time, to lighten the body of the bird, making flight easier to maintain and control. Birds are amazingly constructed. With all this in mind, read Matthew 10, 29-31, and the question they ask is, what comfort can you find in these words? And the text involved are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. But the very heads, hairs of your head are now all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more, more value than many sparrows. And then the creation of the land animals. In Genesis 1, 24 to 31, 
which we will not read here. Terrestrial animals and humans were created on the sixth day, as with the correlation between the second and fifth days. A correlation is also seen between the division of the land and sea on the third day and the filling of the land on the sixth day. One is reminded again of the orderly and purposeful sequence of creation events, as is consistent with the God of order. And it, com it asks to compare 1 Corinthians 14.33. As with the creatures created on the fifth day, the wording of the text indicates that a plurality of types was created on the sixth day of creation. A diversity of beasts, cattle, and creeping things were created as well. There is no single ancestor of all land animals. God instead created many distinct and separate lineages. Notice the expression, according to their kind, or similar phrases in Genesis 1, 11, 21, 24 and 25. Some have attempted to use this phrase to support the idea of fixed kinds, an idea taken from Greek philosophy. The ancient Greeks thought that each individual was an imperfect expression of an unchanging ideal known as a type. Yet the fixity of species is not consistent with the biblical teaching that all of nature suffers from the curse of sin, suggesting that species can change somewhat. We know that species have changed, as expressed in the curse of Genesis 3. Ellen White wrote about the threefold curse on the earth, the curse after the fall, after Cain's sin, and after the flood. And is seen in parasites and predators that cause so much suffering and violence. The meaning of the phrase according to their kind is best understood by examining the context in which it is used. Genesis 6.20 and 7.14 and Leviticus 11.14-22. How is the expression after its kind or an equivalent phrase applied? And we're going to look those up. How do these examples help us to understand the phrase of Genesis in Genesis 1? And uh, first, Genesis 6.20, of the fowls after their kind and the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. They and every beast after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And this is pretty close to a literal translation of the Hebrew. And then here's the last one. This is Leviticus 14. And I think this is one place where it's perhaps a little more obvious that, that using kind as uh, some kind of a scientific uh, definition falls a little bit short, I think. The vulture and the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, and the owl and the night hawk and the cuckoo and the hawk after his kind. Uh, these are all difficult to translate Hebrew words that um, some of them are very common and so they, they can be guessed at pretty closely, but the difference between the little owl and the owl, for example, um, exactly what that meant in the Hebrew mind is not clear. Uh, the cormorant, the great owl, and the swan, and the pelican, and the gear eagle, and the stork, and the heron after her kind, and the, and the lapwing, and the bat. Now, it's interesting because this is discussing uh, winged creatures. And the Hebrew mind didn't divide between mammals and, uh, and birds. They were all wolf or winged creatures. And so, I mean, they knew the difference between a bat and a bird. But to them, the most significant thing was the similarity. They both flew. Um, and I have my doubts. I don't know, but uh, I have my doubts that the, uh, that the bats are all of one uh, genetic type that diversified. 
And that's one of the reasons why I'm a little bit cautious about saying that the Genesis kind is trying to tell us something specifically scientific. I think what it's trying to do is it just simply list. This is, frankly, a, um, um, a field guide to edible animals. That's what this is. And, uh, and so it doesn't try to make too many distinctions. It tries to make them as clear as possible for people who are trying to figure out, well, should I eat this or not? All fowls that creep going on all four shall be an abomination to you. Yet these you may eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet, to leap with all upon the earth. Even of these you may eat the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. Um, I really doubt that beetles were all one uh, kind at one point. I think that there were probably several different sets of beetles that were originally created. And that's the difficulty of trying to make this into some kind of a scientific uh, classification. The phrase after his kind or an equivalent should not be interpreted as some rule of reproduction. Rather, it refers to the fact that there were diverse kinds of creatures involved in the respective stories. Some Bible translations use the phrase of various kinds, which seems more true to the context. Instead of referring to fixity of species, the phrase refers to the diversity of creatures created on the sixth day. From the time of creation, there have been many kinds of plants and animals. The creation completed. After the creation was completed in six days, we'll study the crea creation of humanity later. We find the first mention of the Bible of the seventh day. And read Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Note especially verse 1, which emphasizes the completion of all that God had done. Why is this so important in our understanding of the significance of the seventh day? And the relevant text is, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it, that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. The Hebrew word for rest in this text is Shabbat, which is closely related to the word for Sabbath. In fact, the letters are exactly the same uh, in the Hebrew Bible. The pointing is different, showing that it's being used as a noun instead of a verb, so that if we quote that text again, on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, we can just as easily, or perhaps more accurately, in fact, translated, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he Sabbathed. That's using it as a verb instead of a noun, sort of like we at first had a company that made copies, and uh, then all copies got to be called Xerox after a while, and you went and Xeroxed something. Uh, well, this is the same idea. It's you're using that and he Sabbathed on the second, seventh day from all his work which he had made. It indicates a cessation of labor upon completion of a project. God was not weary and in need of rest. He was finished with his work of creating, and so he stopped. God's special blessing rests on the seventh day. It is not only blessed but also sanctified, which carries the meaning of being set apart and specially speci devoted to God. Thus God gave special significance to the Sabbath in the context of the relationship between God and humans. Read Mark 2, 27 and 28. And what did Jesus say was the purpose of the Sabbath? And again, there's the text, and he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Notice that the Sabbath was not made because God had a need, but because man had a need, for which God made provision. At the end of that first week, God rested from his act of creation and devoted his time to relationship with his creatures. Remember, God could have created any way he wanted to. In fact, Augustine thought that God had to create instantaneously because 
Otherwise, you would have stuff that was not perfect. But apparently, one of the things that God wanted to demonstrate is that you didn't have to have everything complete in order to have stuff that was good. Humans needed the, the communion with their maker in order to understand their place in the universe. Imagine the joy and wonder that Adam and Eve experienced as they conversed with God and beheld the work, the world that he had made. The wisdom of this provision for rest became even more evident after sin. We need the Sabbath rest in order to prevent us from losing sight of God and getting caught up in materialism and overwork. And in fact, uh, one of the things they tell ministerial students is, you're not going to get your rest on Saturday, so you better pick another day that you're going to rest from your work. Um, otherwise, you'll have the same problem that everybody else does who tries to do seven days a week, 24 hours a day. God commands us to give one-seventh of our lives to the remembrance of the act of creation. What should that tell us about the importance of the teaching? How can you learn to have a deeper and richer experience with the Lord through resting on the Sabbath as he himself did? And then finally, the literal day. Read Genesis 1, 5, 8, and 31. And what are the components of a creation day? Does anything in the verse imply that these are not literal 24-hour days as we experience them today? And Genesis 5 is God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God saw everything that he made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and in between um, are of course other texts that have the same refrain, only changing the number. The nature of the days of creation has been the subject of much discussion. It shouldn't have to be. Some have questioned whether the days were ordinary days or whether they might represent much longer periods of time. The text's description of the creation days provides the answer to that question. The days are composed of an evening or dark period and a morning or light period and are consecutively numbered. That is, the days are expressed in a way that very clearly shows that they are days just as we now experience them, an evening and a morning, a period of darkness and a period of light. It is difficult to see how the statement could be more clear or explicit in describing the days of a week. The repeated expression, and there was evening and there was morning, emphasizes the literal aspect of each day. Read Leviticus 23.3. What indication do we have that all seven days of creation week were the same kind of days as those that we experience? Now, I, this one went beyond me, and maybe if somebody else wants to comment about uh, exactly what the author had in mind, um, the text reads, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest of, and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. It doesn't specifically say anything about creation week. Uh, I, I just I see that as a kind of a, a weak argument. Pardon the expression. Uh, but that's what's in the quarterly. The ancient Hebrews were in no doubt as to the name, nature of the Sabbath day. It was a day of ordinary length, but carried a special blessing from God. Note the explicit comparison of God's work week of six days with our work week of six days and the corresponding comparison of the day of rest for God in us. And uh, they say, look at the fourth commandment as well. Even many scholars who reject the idea of these being literal days often admit that the writers of the Bible understood that literal days were meant. And that's pretty much true. So crucial to our relationship with God is our trust in God and his word. If we can't trust the word of God on something as foundational as explicitly stated as the Genesis creation in six literal days, what can we trust him on? And then... Uh, for further study, this is, I think, Friday's lesson now. As stated previously, the days of creation week are numbered and identified as being composed of a dark period 
the evening and a light period the morning. There is no reasonable way in which to interpret these days other than being like the days we experience today. Some have appealed to such texts as Psalms 94 and 2 Peter 3.8 when arguing that each creation day actually represents a thousand years. This conclusion is not suggested by the text and does nothing to resolve the issue created by those who think that these days represent billions of years. Also, if the days of Genesis represented long epochs, one would expect to find succession in the fossil record that matches the succession of the living organisms created in the successive six creation days. Thus, the first fossils should be plants, which were created on the third day. Next should be the first water animals and the air animals. Finally, we should find the first land animals. The fossil record does not match this sequence. Water creatures come before plants, and land creatures come before air creatures. The first fossil fruit trees and other flowering plants appear after all these other groups. The only point of similarity is that humans appear last in both accounts. Of each successive day of creation, the sacred record declares that it consisted of the evening and the morning, like all of the days that have followed. That's Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets. And in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, she really zeroes in on this. But the infidel sub supposition that the events of the first week required seven vast indefinite periods for their accomplishment, strikes directly at the foundation of the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. It makes indefinite and obscure that which God has made very plain. It is the worst kind of infidelity, for with many who profess to believe the record of creation it is infidelity in disguise. Pretty strong words there. Uh, discussion questions, and we'll just go over these. I'm not going to uh, stop until we get through uh, two other pieces of uh, uh, sets of information and then we'll open the floor for anybody. We, we can come back to these questions too. Even from a non-literalist interpretation of Genesis, two points are obvious. Nothing was random in the act of creation and there was no common ancestry for the species. Now along comes Darwinian evolution which, which in its various versions teaches two things randomness and the common ancestry for all species. How then does one interpret Genesis through a theory that at its most basic level contradicts Genesis at its most basic level? And number two, why is it important to understand that science for all the good it does is still merely a human endeavor? And number three, all science has availability to study, has available to study is a fallen world, one that is very different in many ways from the original creation. Why is it important to keep that truth ever before us? And uh, now I'm moving on to uh, some comments, kind of, uh, many of the comments in chapter three of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gibson's book are actually fairly well covered in the Sabbath School lesson. Um, and I won't go over that again. But uh, some things that, uh, that he points out, one of them is that there's forming and filling the world. And there is, in fact, a, you know, you start out with light, and then you create the sun and moon. You, then you go with uh, the atmosphere and separating the waters, and you have creatures in the atmosphere and in the waters. And then finally you have uh, the dry land appearing, and then plants, and then the animals uh, on the sixth day. So there's a parallel there. The sun is appointed its purpose on day four, or the sun was created on day four. It's not clear which one. We've talked about that at some last week, but um, if somebody wants to go over that again, we can do that. Um, that the kinds that are mentioned in the Bible is not the same as species. It's not even the same as Genesis kinds. Um, that the creation is very good um, because there's no violence, 
either done in creating the creation. Jesus didn't have to slay some kind of a dragon and split its body in half or anything like that. That it was simply just done by his word. And that when he got done, animals did not do violence to each other. Um, it's well designed. And that is still true even after all the disasters that have happened since. It was given a capable manager who unfortunately fell down on the job, but, um, and it was given a regular schedule. And so that's, you know, a very good creation. And uh, then I'm going to come back to, this is the teacher's quarterly, and you get to see that this is a, an interesting little passage. Now, this is not written by James Gibson. It's actually written by somebody else, and I forgot his name. I should have put that name down. I'll correct that if I do it again. Um, uh, but this is what's in Teacher's Quarterly. Flexible facts versus fixed truth. The challenge of evolution to a belief in the young earth creation. And it says read Genesis 1 with the class, and then it says young earth creation is treat Genesis 1 as a straightforward historical account that depicts how God made the world in six literal consecutive contiguous days. Current scientific theory presents difficulties for this view. As a result, some Christians try to solve this dissonance. One alternative denies the inspiration of scripture, relegating stories such as Genesis 1 to the status of relics from humankind's pre-scientific past. While admitting that the author of Genesis intended to teach a literal seven-day creation week, the believers in this alternative assert that the author was scientifically wrong. Others attempt to affirm both the inspiration of scripture and the authority of current scientific theory. A frequent tactic is to assert that Genesis 1 is some kind of literary genre other than historical narrative, and it doesn't matter which they picked all of them, um, uh, without much support, by the way. And mostly it's just asserted that it isn't. Um, this allowing us to understand the creation days as being non-literal and in harmony with long chronologies. Such assertions have, challenge, have some challenges, however, when looking at the text itself. First, when the Hebrew word for day you know, appeared in the Old Testament with an ordinal number, first, second, actually it's one, second, third, fourth. It's just very interesting. Um, it's Yom Ahad, one day. Um, the combination al always depicts a literal day. Additionally, the presence of evening-morning vocabulary in Genesis 1 makes it hard to escape the obvious. The author clearly intended us to read the account as a basic chronological history with real days like the days we experience now. Second, there is a Hebrew construction called the Wow Consecutive, or uh, if you have a more uh, uh, modern Western Hebrew, it's a Vav Consecutive, just how you pronounce that letter, which is a hallmark of Hebrew historical narrative. Wow is a conjunction that is generally the equivalent of and or but in English, mostly and. And when you read King James and it says, and so-and-so happened, and so-and-so, and, so and, so, and you, you keep going, you know, all the verses start with and, and after a while you're going, what's what this? Well, that's because that's the while constructive, the consecutive. That's the way they construct the, uh, the, uh, uh, the stories that they, that they told. And if you read a literal or close to literal translation, you'll get the feel of it after a while. Um, The consecutive wow is used in a story that is reporting sequences of consecutive actions in historical narratives. Um, all the classic stories in Genesis, including the flood and the sacrifice of Isaac, are liberally sprinkled with wow consecutives. By contrast, wow consecutives are rarely used in poetic genres, such as the Psalms and the wisdom literature. With Genesis 1 employing over 40 wow consecutives, we have strong evidence that the author felt that he was writing historical narrative. But why might this be important? Re reinterpretations of Genesis 1 attempt to make the creation story more palatable to the modern mind at the expense of the obvious reading of the text, raising questions about biblical authority. As such, 
there is some similarity to attempts to reinterpret the plain meaning of the Sabbath, especially of the Seventh-day aspect, in order to make one of God's commandments more palatable to a Sunday-oriented society. The literal but wrong advocates mimic the method of medieval Catholicism, which admitted that the Bible taught that the Seventh-day Sabbath, but claimed that there was a higher authority than Scripture, the Church, which had reinterpreted it, allowing the change of interpretation. And other Christians trying both to affirm biblical authority and to circumvent the Seventh-day dimension of the Sabbath introduced various textual reinterpretations not unlike the current in attempts to reinterpret Genesis 1. Those trying to affirm the authority of the text while attempting to provide a more palatable reinterpretation may have more difficulty acknowledging the plain sense of the text than those who outright deny biblical inspiration and authority. Consider this. Uh, scientific knowledge is always subject to revision and therefore is never fixed and absolute. By contrast, we believe that God, and hence his word, is eternally true and unchanging. Consider the irony in this question. Why do some Christians reverse the concept? Treating flexible scientific knowledge as fixed, absolute truth, while treating scripture as relative and revisable. While this sort of treatment seems to be an attack on the authority of scripture, what does the attack, what does the answer to this question reveal about what is really under attack? And now, I saved up all of the questions, and I'll put the first two on, and, uh, but basically turn the discussion over to you, and if you wanted to look at some of the other ones to start the discussion, you're welcome to do so. Um, yes. I'd like to go back to the um, flexible versus the inflexible. Um, what do you think that Ellen White meant when she meant when she talked about current truth? Um, flexible versus. Un well, he was talking about science being flexible, or oh, the word being flexible, you mean or this, something. This here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, when, when she says current truth, that makes me think that there's a progression happening of understanding what the Bible says. Now, the, the other question comes up that if current truth changes, does it mean that the, the truth before was wrong? And I don't think that's correct because uh, you might say that it wasn't wrong. Maybe the emphasis has changed more closer to the vine of the truth. But, yeah. but that's my, my big thing right now is why is it that, you know, you have this argument about the scriptures being fixed, you know, as far as truth goes, that the word stands forever and ever, which is true, but you wonder about um, hermeneutics, you know, with all the problems that has. And does that change? I think it does, and I think that's what Ellen White was talking about when she talks about current truth, because... Or the phrase I think she really was, had favored was present truth. And that, by the no, way... No, she said current truth. Well, present truth. Yeah. I think... And, by the way, she stole that out of the Bible itself. Well, still... I'm, I don't care about the, the exact words or yeah. whatever. The concept right. is there. The concept. The concept of this is, this is what you need to know now. And uh, this is what God's calling you to. That you have to know now? Or is it showing a progression? Because our, when we go to heaven, don't, isn't it said over and over that we're going to be learning forever and ever? And yet we act like we deny that um, when we say that the, when God tells you something it's true because God said it that's all there is to it well um, <clears throat> my own uh, my own feeling is that that particular uh, 
par a set of paragraphs that I read at the very end. I'm glad I didn't get into the regular quarterly because I think that there is a tendency to try to want to settle the discussion by <coughs> saying the Bible is true and just forget about all this science stuff. Um, it doesn't matter anyway. And that will work for people who don't have to deal with science on an everyday basis. But for people who, whose jobs are deeply involved with science, it won't. Uh, I have to have some reason, for example, for believing uh, that the Bible is accurate when looking at, uh, let's say, the story of Joshua's long day. And Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. And the Bible goes on to say, and the sun stood still. He also commanded the moon to stand still, which, why would you have to do that if you, you know... Um, It was a very interesting day. Um, and there's a tendency for us to say, well, Joshua really didn't understand what was going on. Uh, therefore, the Bible contains a, an error in concept. And therefore, we should just toss the whole thing out. Uh, that's a logical, uh, not necessarily um, approved way of dealing with it. But I can pass this back. Um, I'm just a little uncomfortable about, about simply saying that, uh, you know, just believe the Bible, uh, don't worry about the science, because you can't, you can't effectively do that in my profession and in a lot of other professions. And that's one of the reasons. I think that it's important for us to go back to the Bible and look at it. And I think it's important for us to look at it carefully. But I think when you do look at it carefully, you come out with the idea that this was intended to be six, 20, I won't say 24 hour days. It might have been 24 and a half or, you know, 23 and three quarters. Uh, but they were, they were days of, that we would recognize as days if we're, if we're on the, the planet at the time. And uh, um, the, the, the story that we get is one of appearances. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it's important for us to wrestle with the scientific data as well as with the biblical data. Um, but the biblical data doesn't allow for a lot of wiggle room. And uh, at a certain point, you have to recognize that there, the current scientific consensus cannot be uh, effectively meshed with the Bible. And that means that if you trust the Bible, the current scientific consensus is wrong. And that means that in all probability, it is testably wrong. And we should be able to go out and look for things mm -hmm. that in fact, strongly suggest that the current scientific consensus needs to be revised. I think that's the more proper way of doing it. Now, that's not for everybody. There are people for whom they're, they're not competent to do that. They're barely competent to understand a little bit of what everybody else is telling them. And uh, you have to realize that the Sabbath school lesson that they're giving is for both types. Um, but I think that I think that for people who are scientifically literate, um, that I, the, the approach to just simply squash everything is, uh, is an approach that, that, um, that bothers me a little bit. Because it looks like what you're doing is you're, you're basically tossing out all scientifically minded people. And 
and I don't like that. That's, by the way, one of the reasons why we have this Sabbath school, is to try to be able to bring uh, together some scientific facts that are pretty well acknowledged that give one pause when trying to uh, take the uh, current scientific consensus as gospel. Uh, we have a comment here and then one over here. Those of us that have attempted to learn a foreign language realize the difficulty of translating correctly and the course of scriptures written in ancient Hebrew and Greek and some Aramaic a long time ago do pose problems to us. Over the last 50 years, my wife and I have collected a lot of books on Jehovah's Witness and Mormons, and we take a certain perverse delight when they come to the door to show them the mistakes that they have made in their interpretations <laughs> and actually changes in their doctrinal views as recorded in some of the older books as opposed to the newer ones. I think the thing in Adventism that embarrasses me most is that 1844 where we interpreted you know, uh, an event that didn't come to pass and uh, even last week I saw it mentioned on television, you know, about the Adventists setting a time of the end. And it was, a, it, was, it was a faulty interpretation or a faulty understanding. It isn't that, that the, the details are wrong, it's our understanding of it. And much of what we're dealing with here is frankly beyond our, beyond our capability to understand. And uh, I, I find the, the scientific common ancestor of everything. I see an elephant on the dry plains of the Serengeti. And I see a newt in the, in the mosses of a, of a moist forest. There are similarities. They both have a body. They both have four legs. They both have a tail. They both have a head and a mouth and two eyes. Obviously, came from the same... I have difficulty rationally seeing that. But I understand four legs is really a good way to get about. I now use walking sticks. Gives me four legs and a great deal more confidence. So what are you going to do? Uh, here and then we'll come back. Um, you brought up Joshua and the sun standing still. Can you elaborate as to what? the meaning of that was? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Joshua, there are three ways that we can take uh, Joshua and the sun standing still. One is that Joshua was speaking eternal truth for all time and in a clear way. Uh, and, and that is a position that people would use to argue against Galileo's theory that the sun goes around the earth. Uh, pardon me, the, the earth goes around the sun. The, they would argue that the sun goes around the earth because Joshua told it to stop. And the text says, and it stopped. And so it's not only Joshua, but whoever was writing this little passage. Uh, looks, like the, looks like their conception was that the sun moved in the sky. This created a lot of trouble, for example, uh, when... Uh, uh, St. Augustine was studying Genesis and couldn't figure out. He says, I can understand it, the light before the sun. He says, but what I can't figure out is why it would go around the world. And of course, nowadays we say, duh, the earth turns. You know. Um, but interestingly enough, that, that objection is still brought up on occasion. Uh, with the total, total uh, non- cognizance of the idea that that, that was Augustine's problem and, and not, uh, not a modern one, that modern cosmology has actually solved that problem. All you have to have is unidirectional light and the earth turns and, and part of it gets daylight and part of it or whatever light there was and uh, part of it doesn't. So the text is not correct? I would say that there was an incorrect idea in the mind of Joshua and in the mind of the 
person who wrote the book. So therefore, as it is written, it is not correct. It's uh, in the Bible. Yes, I, I think that's fair to say. Now, before you get too excited about this, remember uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist got up and preached a message that was God sent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he preached very well, drew big audiences, had a following for a while, had a following even after Christianity. There were disciples of John the Baptist who were not disciples of Jesus. Uh, and uh, Paul ran into a few of them, if I remember right, in Corinth. Um, but the point is that John, that John preached and then he got thrown in prison and then he sent messengers to Jesus saying, you know, what's going on here? Are you, uh, are you the one who is to come or are we looking for somebody else? Well, he had already endorsed him. But the, this, the kingdom of heaven had a, a part of that idea was actually incorrect in John's mind even though I think it was a heaven-sent message. That to insist that everything that an inspired writer thinks has to be actually factually correct, I think is too tight. And I don't think the Bible itself would pass that. Uh, transfer to Genesis? Uh, to transfer to Genesis, I... Um, I think that the uh, that uh, Bernard Taylor actually had a good point when he presented here that the story is one where there is a narrator and the narrator has a point of view. The narrator is sitting or floating on the ocean and there's water everywhere. And uh, and then light comes, and then he sees the waters above separating from the waters below, and it's something there. He can't see it, but it's there. Um, and then dry land emerges, then plants come up. And so he's describing what he sees in the standard vernacular of, of what he has to say. And that description has to fit with any scientific model that you're going to make as to what is biblical. And that doesn't leave you a lot of room to put in three billion years worth of uh, slow evolution of, of plants, animals, and humans. Yes? I'd like to go back to the comment that he brought up just a little bit ago, the first gentleman that spoke, about um, present truth or current truth or whatever. Ellen White also makes a comment that truth doesn't change, that it stands forever. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the context of that quote was. I don't know whether anybody knows what was she talking about when she says that there's present truth. Was she talking theologically? Was she talking scientifically? Was she talking about the educational system? What was she talking about? I th but, but truth, are you talking about, is, does God exist? Does our idea of God exist? Is that going to change or was she talking about truth in general? I think it's helpful to understand the context of what she's saying because I hear that particular quote quite a bit and have probably used it myself and I think we need to use it with caution. I teach a class in the integration of faith and learning and one of the things I tell my students is you need to find out for yourself what is true because you're going to hear all kinds of voices. If that is, If I'm correct, then there is truth out there to be found. And, and it's our responsibility to figure out what that is and to understand it as best we can. I don't think that that implies that we're all, at some point in our lives, we're going to understand everything correctly because we now know what truth is. 
Mm -hmm. but, there is, but I do believe that there is truth. I may not know what it all is, but I think that there is absolute truth beginning with the existence of God. And, and I think that I... No, I, I think we can know it imperfectly, and I think that our responsibility is to continue to try to figure out what it is. But I don't think that that automatically means that what, what we have come up with as truth now is wrong and going to change. It may be that we're just adding to our understanding. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think that that's an important thing, that there is an absolute truth out there. And science is, is a way of approximating it. And if science is done in an undistorted way, it can be a fair approximation. Uh, but you have to keep in mind several things. Number one, we do live in a damaged world. And so extrapolations from what we see in science can't be, can't be uh, uncritically extrapolated into the indefinite future or indefinite past. I think that's one of the things we have to learn. Um, and so there's predation now. There's always been predation as far as we, kn we have experienced it. Um, where's the other mic? Oh, we got, we got lots of people here. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we are approaching something. And maybe, maybe the best way I can put it is in science. Um, there was a big theoretical brouhaha when Albert Einstein came up with his theory of relativity because it seemed to overthrow in the extreme gravity. But in fact, in most normal situations, uh, it reduces to gravity and we navigated to the moon based on Newton's equations, not Einstein's equations because the corrections were so small. Sometimes they do become important such as when they're launching GPS satellites, we have to figure out exactly what happens to time <coughs> during the launch and after it gets up there in order to have the signals be precisely calibrated. And, uh, and for that, relativity makes a difference. But uh, for most, it, it's very much like what happened to uh, uh, heliocentrism versus geocentrism. It makes a big theoretical difference. In fact, the way we live our lives, it doesn't matter most of the time. And the Bible was not written to give us the end theory. The Bible was written for us to understand how to live our lives. And that's why what I see as the big conflict between creation and evolution isn't whether you believe every word that's in the Bible. Well, which translation? Oh, you have to know the original Hebrew and Greek. So how many of you have learned Hebrew and Greek so you can read it in the original? Nobody? Well, I have, but it <laughs> turns out it doesn't help you all that much. Um, it helps a little bit on the corner somewhere. but. Most of the time, the translations are pretty good. Uh, the point of it is that ev all of us have to live our lives dealing with the truth that we can get hold of. And for some, that means digging a little deeper. For others, it means uh, you know, taking what you can and, and, and living, with what, uh, living with what it is. And the, the real crucial differences between creation and evolution come down to, you know, one, was it a six-day event? If not, why are we Seventh-day Adventists? And number two, was it an event where God created an originally perfect world in which we fell? Or is it a world which has been gradually getting better and better? Is it a world in which God intervenes? Or is it a world in which God just lets whatever happen happen? And those are the crucial worldview things that, that really make a difference. And that's why I think it's worth fighting for, 
even though it's kind of a theoretical point because of the practical ramifications. And we, we, get, we get too tied up sometimes in the practical, uh, the, uh, or the, the, the theory, when sometimes it doesn't make too much difference. It's very much like, how did light happen before the sun? Well, we don't know. Without a video, we're not going to know. Hopefully, when we get to heaven, we'll be able to see one. But uh, uh, but the description is a phenomenological description of what happened using the concepts of the day and uh, you know the fact that we divide bats into many more uh, families than uh, than the uh, ancient Hebrews did didn't matter you know the, the key is uh, understanding what it would have mean and the principles involved and what the what the main point of each uh, of each narrative is what the main point of each uh, um, of each revelation, if you like, and taking that to the bank. And I don't think you can do that between creation and evolution. Yes? And then uh, I was going to discuss uh, present truth. My understanding of present truth is what's the truth for our time. Like for Ellen White, the 1844 and the Christ's um, righteousness by faith, that became crucial in Noah's time. It was the coming of the flood, the destruction of the earth. There's a present truth for each age, and that's my understanding of present truth, uh, and how Ellen White was using it. And, and when she was discussing um, progression of truth, and I know there's, I was thinking, uh, councils to writers and editors, but I don't know if that's, but there are several places where she talks about the progression of truth that that the new truth for our understanding is never, never contradicts what's gone before. It's always consistent with what God has taught his people up to that point. Yeah. Um, co go ahead and comment and then pass the mic over. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Sandy pretty much stole my thunder on that one. <laughs> anyway, I was going to make a comment about the um, Joshua tell, telling the sun to stand still, the moon to stand still. I think he was just looking at it the same as we would today. The sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening. He wasn't making a scientific uh, command or observation. He was just saying, this is what I would like to have happen. He wasn't concerned with how it happened. And, uh, and I agree with you. Yeah, I think we've talked about this before this um, class. And see, this is, this yeah, is the I'm thing where people will, people will get really antsy about. Well, okay, did he use the right words? Mm, it depends. Um, did, he, did he have the right ideas in his, um, in his mind? Well, he had most of them. Did he have the idea that the earth went around the sun and revolved? And what he was really asking for was the stopping of the revolution of the earth? Uh, maybe. We don't know. We don't know. Um, if, I'm, if I'm trying to be perfectly fair, I don't find that idea popping up anywhere until uh, about Pythagoras' time in Greece. Uh, but, but, but what, he's, what he's really asking for is more sunlight, you know, yeah. and that's what he really wanted. And he didn't, I mean, if you had nudged him uh, it, it, after he said that and said, hey, don't you mean that you want the earth to stop turning so that the sun will stay in the sky? Uh, he would have said, you crazy? That, that is, if you didn't get the butt of his spear. Uh, you know, he's, he's got a job to do and he doesn't care about those niceties. Um, I don't want to have to defend that Joshua really knew better than what he said. That's, I guess, the thing that I would want to say. But, see, there's a world of difference between saying that and saying, you know, the incident never happened. 
There never was a long day in Joshua's time. That's just poppycock because the world doesn't stop for anybody. And uh, what we really have is the, that there was some kind of psychological thing that helped the Israelites fight faster. I, that's the kind of thing that it just wouldn't make sense. And see, this is, this is where you, you start realizing that it's the phenomenology carries its own, if you want to call that scientific, it carries its own real world emphasis. I'm willing to give the, you know, what happens to the day-night thing. Uh, that, one, that one I don't, it, it doesn't bother me. Um, but it does bother me when you start ripping out whole pages, pages of the Bible and saying, no, that is just all rubbish. It's a description of what people believed and what people saw in their own time. Okay, um, I have just one more comment. Sure. Um, on on the, uh, what Mrs. White meant by present truth, and I think as I've studied it, her present truth is always in a spiritual realm and not a scientific realm. And as Sandy mentioned, the present truth in Noah's time was the flood was coming, the present truth in Jesus' time, well, John the Baptist was preaching present truth. Today we have the present truth of the second coming of the Lord. None of the present truths um, say anything against the previous, but the previous message is not for our time. We have a message for our time. That's present truth for us. But it's always spiritual. It's not really scientific. But uh, I don't think that John the Baptist had a full concept of what the kingdom of heaven was about. But he preached the truth that he was given for He that preached time. the truth that he was given. Um, and I don't think that it's fair to ask any inspired person other than perhaps Jesus himself uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, have all the concepts right. And in fact, I, you know, it raises an interesting question. Was the child Jesus, when he was five years old, did he understand quantum physics? Uh, when did he get it? When he was two? Uh, why not be just born with it? Knew when to cry, when not to cry. You know, how much of Jesus was actually human? How much did he have to learn? And it's, a, it's an interesting comment because we don't really, we have this one time when Jesus comes into the temple at the age of 12 and the, the spiritual leaders of the day uh, looked at him and said, you know, this guy is asking some brilliant questions. You know, um, did he have all the answers? I don't know. How much was he dependent on his father directly? How much was he dependent on um, learning that he got from his mother? It's, it's really hard to say. Uh, the, the picture we get is not one of somebody who uh, uh, knew everything at the very beginning but somebody who's very perceptive and, and uh, allowed God to live through him. We're told he learned just like every other person. What he, knew, what he knew while he was on earth is what he learned from his study of prophecy and what he was taught. That's what we're told. Which is interesting because he got his message out of the Old Testament then. Yeah, in terms of discussing this uh, present truth concept, I mean, it, we recognize the problem in that when we talk about theology, we're not, it's theology, not theodicy. Uh, in the, uh, theology, we're, we're trying to think about what God might have been thinking. If we were talking about, if we knew what God was really thinking, we'd be talking about theodicy, uh, where in that sense, we're talking about it, what God was actually thinking. And uh, so and, and we don't generally go there because we recognize that, you know, we don't know exactly what God was thinking. Um, that is true. Yeah. Um, uh, along a different line, um, if we're going to uh, think about 
uh, I, when we talk about a young earth, we're talking about the earth and referring that to creation week. Um, uh, we have no problem accepting that the universe itself may have been much older. So uh, uh, somewhere in Genesis, it's got to talk about a long period of time. If it's not during the seven days of creation, that's a, that explained, uh, that, that's described. Where is the long period of time that would refer to the entire universe? Uh, where is that found in, in, in Genesis 1? Um, we'll uh, let, let Ariel Rhodes uh, talk about this. I, I just want to uh, mention, uh, in a way, the Bible seems fairly clear that there was an earth covered with water before creation week. In Genesis, of course, it describes the earth, you know, as being by form void and so on, and the Spirit got over the face of the deep. That's verses one, verses two, that's verse two, verse three, of course, it talks about, and God said, that's where his... That's the first uh, consecutive. But, interestingly, uh, if you look at some other texts, uh, like uh, Psalms 24, I came with my ammunition here. Uh, <laughs> Psalms we appreciate that. <laughs> Psalms 24, 2. It says, For he f have founded it, speaking of Lord and creation, upon the seas and established upon the floods. Uh, sounds like there was an earth there with water first. Uh, you read Psalms uh, 136, verse 4. Actually, excuse me, it's probably verse 6 here. Uh, to him that stretched out the earth above the waters. You read Second Peter 3, uh, verse uh, 5, and it speaks of the uh, God and so on, that people would be willing to rent of so on, creation and so on. And, uh, the word of God in the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and then in the water, which was the flood. Uh, so uh, we have some very fairly clear text here suggests that there was a earth here with water before creation week, uh, and when when God proceeds with His creation process, He's got He's got a, an earth covered with water to start out with. Uh, the uh, Job thirty-eight nine uh, talks about, you know, the earth being dark, and that fits with Genesis 1. That, it doesn't mention seas there in Job 39, but it, it's, to me it's interesting that there is that aspect that, uh, now I, I, I'll admit that, you know, uh, to me it sounds like uh, in Genesis uh, 1, 14 that, you know, the sun was created on the fourth day and the moon was created on the fourth day on that side, but I think the, the majority of the bio, the bio writers, they had this concept that there was an earth here that was covered with water before creation. My yeah, in that. fact, if you were to push them on it, I'm not, uh, I'm not even sure that all of the biblical writers would be able to tell you that the earth is, for example, round. Um, I'm not sure that all of them would be able to tell you uh, that that actually underneath the water there's more earth. Uh, certainly you read those passages, it almost sounds like the earth was put on, on, on water. And these are people to whom God is revealing ideas and they're trying to express them in the, na in the language that they have. Um, and I think if you're trying to be as sympathetic to them as you can, uh, you'd have to say that not everybody that became an inspired writer instantly knew everything. 
and so could say everything in an exactly uh, perfect way. Now, there, there, there are people who believe that God overruled, and so everything that got into the Bible has no mistakes. Well, then God didn't overrule so that mistakes couldn't happen in transcription. Uh, I just have a, I have a hard time, uh, I mean, if you look at Ellen White, for example, and I realize that for non-Adventists this isn't a big deal, but for Adventists it should be. There was a point when a brother said to her, well, you know, doesn't the Bible say we shouldn't eat pork? And she said, you know, now's not the time for that. Uh, uh, if God decides that's what needs to happen, then we'll, it will be revealed in the appropriate time. Well, later on, she agreed with the guy. Um, obviously, at that point, she didn't understand. Things keep unfolding, and that means that some of the new stuff has to be, you know, overlaid on top of the old. Um, and it's, that's the way with scientific theories as well. Einstein was a brilliant, uh, brilliant guy. Um, Newton was a brilliant guy. And Newton got it 99.9 .9 something percent right. His rules are very simple and, and they made sense. And the only, the only problems we get is when we're dealing with very high speeds or very large masses. Um, what that means is that scientific theories um, do eventually change. The theoretical structure changes. The practical structure really doesn't change very much. Now, technology converges. Uh, although occasionally we get things like the laser, which are you know brand new technology. Um, but but science itself makes complete changes. Is light a particle? Newton thought so. Is light a wave? Uh, Huygens, or whatever, however you pronounce his name, thought so. And at first one, then the other one, and now we're at the confusing stage where light behaves like a particle in some situations and like a wave in others. And the two of them can be separated by, you know, less than a femtosecond. Um, uh, that the light that goes through two slits hits a silver halide crystal and behaves like a photon, like a, a single wave. Uh, it's, so we don't really understand, but we understand that both sides were part right. And uh, <clears throat> when our concepts are inadequate, then unless God gives us absolutely, whole, completely, totally new concepts, and and I don't see any really good evidence for that. He gives us a concept, he gives us major concepts and lets us fit it in with the rest of it. And then as time goes on, certain ideas kind of peel away. Um, that God doesn't usually give us a blinding new revelation of everything. And I think that that's the way it's with scripture as well. Uh, yes, and then back yeah, to Newton. I don't. I wouldn't agree that he had it 99 percent right. He did about the two body problem, but not the end body problem. He Newton was not able to understand how to handle multiple interactions between multiple bodies, and that has nothing to do with relativity. It's just that he didn't. He invented the calculus, but not didn't get to the uh, to applications of diff of uh, partial equa partial differential equations, in which you can break it down and. In, 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 in and stepwise through the interactions between multiple bodies. So, um, uh, and that's and that's at the point where where uh, Newton uh, give gave credit to God for guiding the planets because he knew that he didn't understand how the planetary system could be so stable. His his physics at that time did not give him the understanding to do that. It was when Laplace. Uh, later on uh, had the better math to um, uh, 
uh, to be able to start dealing with the three body problem and other uh, other uh, end bodies interacting but even yet we don't have a single uh, Newtonian equation for three body we have to work with approximations no the three body problem can be fairly but well defined as the end body problem that you have to work with um, um, with um, um, no, uh, what I mean forces. by that is, is the two-body problem reduces to a single, very easily understood yeah. Um, yeah. equation. The three-body three-body problem does not have that. Uh, it's a little more complicated. Yeah, but, yeah, but not. It's still definable in terms of a, a, a set of equations that are fairly stable. But it's it's. When you get into end bodies, that's that's the, the two-body the problem is uh, solvable yeah. in theory, exactly. Yeah. Whereas the three or four or more bodies, it starts getting into yes, exactly. the kind of complications. Yeah. So it's it's not just a difference between what Newton knew and then Einstein. That is true. It. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the point I was making. But you got to admit, though, um, Newton had his truth for his time. Newton had the truth for his time. Yeah, and I think that that's it. <laughs> and, well, you know, one of the things that we have learned is that... Did you hear that, Dave? <laughs> Newton had the truth for his time. Uh, Newton also, um, I think, illustrates another point, and that is that our theoretical conceptions don't have to be true in order to give us accurate enough results to act upon. And that's really important. Um, our theoretical conceptions, uh, and I think that God will sometimes use theoretical conceptions that people have, uh, even though they're not exactly accurate, because he has a more important truth to teach them at the time. I, I just want to say too. I think Ariel is, 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 you know, gave some, you know, some really good and, and 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 important information about how to look at the Earth prior to Creation Week. Um, for uh, I just wanted to point out another verse that would go along that line is in Proverbs, where he's uh, eight twenty three, where it says, "I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning before the world began." So they're they're um, there are references to beginnings here that are separate events. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it, it gives us the ability to look at the universe as a separate creation event apart from the creation week here on Earth. So I think there's, there's, there's good basis to be able to, to uh, look at it that way. Now the interesting thing is, and I've talked to some of the people in uh, GS, uh, or the, uh, the uh, Young Earth Creationist community, um, and, uh, you know, f have suggested to this, and they've said, well, that could be other universes, but our universe is different. And, of course, that makes it completely unobservable. Um, uh, but it's an, it's an interesting point that, that apparently they, they do concede that there was a time before the beginning that's mentioned in Genesis, or at least they at least the day one that's mentioned in Genesis. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the difference between the two sides is not that wide. And I don't think it's worth us probing hard because I don't, I don't see that we, I don't see that we uh, either change anybody's mind or, or make, uh, I think that the only thing to do is to make sure that, that the option is left for people who uh, who believe, as we do, that uh, that in fact the universe is older than the Earth itself? Yeah, uh, but but what that opens up is a, the the fascinating concept that when we look out into the distant past, by looking far away from the Earth into the ancient universe, we're seeing the the universe as God intended it to function uh, prior to the fall. And so when we study the physics of the universe, we're seeing the physics as God initially intended it to be functioning. And, and, and uh, uh, in, in, in Revelation uh, 
12, 12, it says, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you, indicating that they're, you know, if the rest of the universe, we're different from the rest of the universe, and, if, and it's the evil that exists here. It doesn't apparently exist in the rest of the universe. Um, uh, and when Ellen White talks about the earth as being the one dark blot in God's, in all of God's creation, it's consistent with that concept as well. And, and so yes. uh, this, so we have the ability through astronomy to look at things and see, look at the, the, the nature and how it functions and see it differently, uh, potentially see it differently than what we, uh, you know, uh, than uh, in the realm of, of uh, a nature that is operating in God as God in originally intended it to be without the effects of, uh, of the fall. In, in those processes. So there is the ability uh, in that sense to be able to maybe s identify what is the effects of evil and what isn't um, in that process. So it's, it's something we don't really talk about en enough and I think it's something that could be explored a lot more. Uh, I'm just going to add, uh, one can interpret a statement by Ellen White to think that she probably thought there was something here before and uh, that statement is from Science Times, 8th of January, 1880. She says, in the work of creation, when the dawn of the first day broke and the heavens and the earth by the call of infinite power came out of darkness, uh, it seems to imply that it was there before. Uh, although you, you, can, you can reinterpret things. Uh, uh, the start talking to theologians. Uh, they know how to do this. Uh, but uh, I think it probably implies that uh, sh she may have thought there was something here before. Yeah. And so the, the earth, the matter of the earth, may be older than just creation week. So where is that in, in Genesis 1? Where is that history represented in Genesis 1? Well, uh, the, the place that I would put it is um, during the period of time of Genesis 1-2, and the reason I put it there is because of the way the Hebrew reads. You've heard a lot about the while consecutive. Um, and the while consecutive starts with, with verse 3, and God said. Literally, and will say God. Um, it changes the uh, past, uh, what the Hebrew perfect to imperfect, and puts the while in front of it. Um, and that particular thing is where the, the story really begins. In verse 2, it says, And the earth was. But instead of Wayehi Haaretz, it's Wahaaretz Haya, which means that the, the, uh, the wow is stuck in front of the noun instead of the verb. It's specifically excluding the while consecutive. And so this is kind of an interjection here. Now the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving among, uh, upon the waters. And then, and God said, and it takes off. So that kind of implies that at the point where God's talking about the creation of Literally, the sky and the land. I mean, it's heavens and the earth. Um, he's actually talking about our world. Uh, not necessarily even uh, the rest of the things except for the sun. And interestingly enough, the sun does not have any time attached to it. There's nothing in the sun that really tells you. It, there's a maximum time. And that is that it, if it started all its hydrogen and then turned gradually into helium, it, it's about 85%. But you have to ask yourself the question, if that's the case, was there no helium in, the, in what the sun was formed out of? Uh, if there was, of course, that throws a, that kind of calculation completely off. If the sun was made out of 15% helium to begin with, and it's got 15% now, then basically there's been no time that the sun's been burning. 
Uh, the sun does not have any structural features that, that, that make it old. At least not that we know of. Well, the, the, the chemical elements that it has uh, are consistent with being pre-processed in previous um, uh, stellar systems. But not mandatory. And from a, a, a natural it, causal effect, it's, not, it's, it's mandatory, not this, yeah. It's not the same kind of thing as when somebody does a radiometric date on a rock on Earth. Um, there's this mixture of chemicals, and we have theories that could account for it. But there are other... In science, theory is insufficiently... Um, determined by experience. That is to say, if you drop 10 balls off of you know, something and they all land in such and such a second, and if you put a board halfway in it and they land it uh, at, I don't know, whatever it is, the square root of, uh, you know, they, they, uh, you put a board a quarter of the way down and they land it half the time. Okay, you can, you, can, you can say, well, that much is an um, inverse square law. Then you can try a, a different boards with different uh, times and then see how long it takes them to, to fall. You can, you can continue this, but you'll never get a point where you can say that every single ball must fall exactly that way. That is an extrapolation from all the data that we have. Um, and it's, this is particularly difficult when we have sparse data. We happen to have a huge faith in our theories uh, that's supported by the evidence but not proved. Yeah, but stellar evolutionary theory has been tested uh, in many ways and uh, it's, it's a well-established theory in terms of being able to understand how stars are born, grow old, and die. Um, uh, and uh, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's, and the physics, the, mo the models that allow us to, to track that type of change uh, appear to be very good. It's consistent with what we observe in the rest of the universe. Well, it's consistent with what we observe. It's not mandated by it. It's, it's highly suggestive. Yes. Um, and, and, and the point is, the point is that we don't, you know, for one thing, we have never seen a star grow old and die. The closest that I know of is that Sirius in the ancient literature was described as red, whereas nowadays it's blue. And that suggests that uh, Sirius A actually uh, has a small dwarf which suggests that maybe stellar evolution there ha happened much faster than we expect. Well, we saw Supernova 1987 as a star before it exploded. That's been, you know, and uh, we, did, we did see a star die there. It's because, only because it was a very short process. So... Uh, but in, in other words, in terms of our, in terms of our, our actual, we, we're, we're making extrapolations based on little snippets of information. And it's nice, we can make them, and they are consistent, and they help. And I'm not knocking people who do that. I'm just saying that you have to realize that uh, if you're doing history, as opposed to doing science, uh, our theories have to be held in a certain, um, with a certain tentativeness. Because we don't actually have any witnesses to, sh to say for sure what happened. We can extrapolate from what we know. And hopefully it's a good extrapolation. And I encourage people to learn those extrapolations. But I encourage also people also to keep in mind that our knowledge is actually much more slenderly based than what we think. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to go back to assuming that the sun is emitting energy by thermal, uh, gravitational thermal generation. 
uh, we're, we're going to, I don't think we're going to change the concept of uh, the nuclear, nuclear reactions that are going on in the sun, for example. So there's certain things that are fixed and will not change. Uh, it's just a, a lot of details may change in the future. Well, I, I think you're right. Uh, I'm just, uh, if, if we have to be perfectly fair, we have to say that that's our limited knowledge and we hope that it contains the right answer. Um, and, you know, who knows, another 20 years and somebody may come up with a new theory that, that completely explains everything. Uh, and then we'll find out that our theories were close, but not quite good enough. And so, I, you know, I think it's a good theory. I think we should learn it. I, I think we need to be careful about extrapolating out from our knowledge to God's knowledge. Um, extrapolate when you want to. Always acknowledge that it's an extrapolation. Yeah, our God's ways are not our ways. That's, That's right. Sure. Well, I think that does it for this uh, week, and uh, we'll see you again next week.